Uh, is it Mueller? Or... Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, hey, I'm Mueller. Mueller. Are you Mueller? Are you also like letting people in the room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. So welcome everyone to Balkan Circle. For people who don't know me, my name is Mary Newberger and excuse me, I'm a historian of Bulgaria here at UT Austin and I'm also the director of our Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies. Kirill, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mary. I'm thrilled again to uh, be on Friday again for yet another uh, Balkan Circle round, uh, this time with a very uh, distinguished and interesting guest. Uh, my name is Kirill Avramov, and I'm an assistant professor of political science with here at the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. I'm also a co-director uh, at the Global Disinformation Lab, uh, and I'm interested in all things political uh, Eastern Europe. So this is this is the time, you know, the, for the connoisseurs uh, to enjoy. Uh, so I'm looking really very much forward to uh, today's session. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today. I'm really excited and it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Florian Bieber, who's a professor of Southeast European history and politics and director of the Center for Southeast European Studies at the University of Graz in Austria. He holds a John Monet Chair on Europeanization of Southeastern Europe and is coordinator of the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisor Group. Recent publications, and I mean, he has so many publications, we can't list them all here today, but include Debating Nationalism, which came out with Bloomsbury in 2020, The Rise of Authoritarianism in the Western Balkans, which came out with Palgrave in 2020, and Negotiating Unity and Diversity in the European Union, Union, which came out also with Paul Grave in 2021 with Roland Bieber. So um, we're excited today to hear Dr. Bieber's talk, Global Connections of a Dalmatian Island, which I love that title. I'm really intrigued to hear your talk today. So go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks Thanks a lot, Mary. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you, even if it's virtual from Friday evening in Graz. Um, so it's also a great chance to talk about something which usually I don't get to talk about when I'm invited to give presentations. I'm usually talking about authoritarianism, decline of democracy, um, and these topics in the Western Balkans, um, as it's termed nowadays. Um, and so I have a pleasure to focus on something a bit, in, in, as, as the Monty Python would say, and now to something completely different. Um, it's not that completely different. Of course, it's still in Southeastern Europe, but it's not contemporary and it's not dealing with uh, uh, the, the current, um, well, travails and challenges the region is facing, but something quite different. Um, I'm also enjoying this presentation as I'm actually frantically scrambling to finish the manuscript, which uh, I don't claim to present here, but which uh, which is the basis for this presentation today. Um, now, let me start by wh why I'm, and the, the Dalmatian island is the island of Hochbar I will be talking about. And let me start out by a very personal note, why I started working on this, because uh, you know that's often left out in these talks, why people actually do this, do the research they do, but it really began when when um, I, uh, 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago with my wife, decided to um, buy an old abandoned building, a stone house on the island of Hvar, uh, which had been left empty for 30 years, and we started renovating it. And here are a couple of pictures, which I didn't take at the time with the aim to show it at any presentation, but more as kind of memorabilia of the way we found the house, which had been abandoned in the late 1980s. As we're looking through the house and the remnants of the, the, the two sisters who had lived there and passed away in the course of the 1980s, we discovered many layers of the history of the island. Um, and you can see some of them here in those pictures. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see movie posters, uh, Rati Mir, P War and Peace, um, 
uh, uh, Mexican soap opera, I guess you could call it, and many other movies, which the two ladies used not as decorative element, but because they were so poor uh, and they had worked in the movie theater in the local village, they used to insulate the walls um, and to kind of cover the wood slates um, with uh, something to have the wind not go through. That house lacked any electricity. It was installed very late um, and no, no flowing water. So you can see movies from all over the world. Um, you can see a self-made little shrine to um, uh, President Tito there in the middle um, as well, cut out of a newspaper. Um, and on the right, you can see um, the mixture of iconography, uh, calendar for Tito and, and from 1977, as well as several editions of the Catholic calendar, which have a very different iconography as that of the Communist Party. And of course, there were many other layers you could find in this house. Um, they included um, aid packages, boxes, which were delivered by the American Red Cross and American aid agencies in the 1940s, which were kept in the cellar uh, and had not uh, rotten. Um, and correspondence, which they and their parents had led over the decades since the late 1890s. So historians treasure trove, and uh, it took some effort to not uh, make, sh make sure it didn't get tossed all, but it was an inspiration of also contradictions between, uh, you know, clear personal um, uh, for favorable views of President Tito, while at the same time being devout Catholics. Um, movie posters which showed the fashions of the 60s, 70s, uh, and before, while at the same time being in a very poor village without plumbing and uh, and uh, and you know functioning electricity for the most uh, time. So this very personal discovery in a certain way opened a window to the past in a way which you don't usually get to see. If you are a researcher, you see this through archives, you see it through books, but you don't see it in this kind of manifest in such a non-planned, chaotic, so to speak, way which is not there to be discovered by historians, but rather just the leftover of somebody's living space, which gives all those layers over time. So out of this very personal discovery and uh, looking I over the years discussed this developed a research project myself to look at the history of this island um and I have now been working on this for over a decade um on and off um, because of course more pressing contemporary issues have always intervened but I'm about to complete a book on this 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 topic which is kind of a long durée history of the island which of course, you could say it's, it's, a, it's a very nice project um, uh, because it is a very nice place. But um, the motivation is to, which grew out of this discovery, is a couple of dimensions which I consider to be maybe relevant beyond writing a history of, of that island. The one is writing a local history um, of a place which is defined not by its national identity, by its you know, ethnic or other identity, but rather by its locality, by a seemingly well-defined space, an island. Um, and it, of course, allows you to write about a place which um, avoids the methodological nationalism which one easily falls into, especially when writing about longer periods of time, where we often take national or nation-state frameworks. And picking an island, of course, allows you to remove yourself from that and see in a certain way what happened uh, through different empires, states, and experiences over time. Um, it's also an effort to take away the focus, which we know of the more local studies in recent decades, which have focused on urban centers. I mean, Mark Mazowa's brilliant book on Salonika or Robert Donia's book on Sarajevo uh, are just two examples of works which focus on the urban centers, the big cities or the important well-known cities. Of course, we have similar books, not just of Southeastern Europe, but more globally. Um, and that's understandable. These you know, cities have a certain appeal, a certain attraction. They are well-known, they are centers. But they're also misleading in many ways because that's not where most people lived. Most people lived for most of history until very recently, not in cities. Um, and so to paint a picture of Southeastern Europe or of any region um, and looking at the cities is to some degree ignoring a very large part of it. Uh, and so picking a place which is both urban and rural, which has not big cities, not like Salonika or Sarajevo, but which has urban settlements, which have with it um, 
centers of learning uh, intellectual scenes, as we'll see, but at the same time also having a rural population right next door. And that relationship becomes very central to understanding local history. And that's quite different than the history of, of urban centers where the rural is often only understood through migration into the cities rather than otherwise. It's also what I try to do, and it's it's more, you know, it's it's a challenging and constant struggle, is how to write a history which is local but also not local, um, which is anchored in local events and anchored in the local history. And of course, I've read extensively, and I'm surprised over the years, discovered the extent to which historians from the island itself and from Dalmatia have written about Khwar and other places. I mean, it's a very, in many ways, a very richly already worked on field, although that rarely reaches the levels of larger academic debates because it's often for local audiences, it's often um, in, uh, linguistically not accessible to a wider audience, um, and it's often also very um, a very narrative and non-analytical and non-contextualized history. So I try to write something which links the local to larger trends where, of course, it's not appealing to those who only want to know about what happened in a particular village or town, but rather what this tells us about larger, uh, larger events. Another point, which uh, again also was my effort, maybe one of more personal challenge of writing a history over longer periods of time, tracing a place over centuries. In my book, I begin in the Venetian period and I end today. Um, so I cover you know, half a millennium with different degrees of, 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 of depth, of course. I did my archival work primarily on the 20th century and a bit on the 19th century, a lot less in earlier periods. But then again, I have been able to rely on extensive uh, secondary sources as well as uh, extensive materials from, um, you know, travel logs and other ones which are available um, even for those who are dubbed um, experts on early modern periods. But I find it an interesting intellectual challenge to work on longer historic, historical periods and to see certain trends um, emerge. Now, the last point is one which I would like to focus on today, which I call the history of global connections. And it's an observation uh, which I've made is that, uh, and that's something I didn't, you know, come into in a certain way when I wrote this book, but rather a discovery or, or, or kind of one of the things, themes which has emerged is that um, the um, an island is often the, um, and I'm gonna, the, an island is often a place which is assumed to associate with isolation, right? With a place which is remote, which is unconnected. Um, and we often find this in combination when we're talking about a place like Khwar or other Dalmatian islands, um, until the rise of modern mass tourism as places which were seen as remote, underdeveloped. We had terminologies by both Yugoslav historians and others of you know, passive regions, uh, regions which are you know, remote backwards and which are unable to sustain the population they have. So these were terms of used also by economists to understand some of the challenges those places faced in the 19th and 20th century, such as high fragmentation of agricultural land, overpopulation in, in relation to the uh, arable and, um, and land which can be used for agricultural purposes. And all of that kind of gave these areas this image of places which are remote and in a certain way unconnected. Now, over my work, one of the most interesting I mean, points which I would like to raise today is the many ways in which a place which is seemingly so peripheral is so well connected and is so much integrated into global you know, exchanges. Um, and as a result, uh, it's not a story of an island. It's actually in many ways stories of island and in a connection, in a much broader sense of connection with many other places. So it's not a story of isolation or the metaphor the island evokes, but it's rather the opposite of how well connected an island can be and not remote, actually, in the way we'd like to think about that. And this is exactly I will give you and my what I will do in my presentation is give you certain kind of more like vignettes of connectedness of how the island was part of global exchanges uh, rather than of isolation. Um, and uh, that, that is uh, you know, one of the themes I've been working on in the book. There, there are many other ones um, uh, of, uh, again, you know, the, the relationship of the island with the mainland, with the, the centers um, of power, which have shifted, um, as I will point out in a second. So the capitals, the main cities, which have evolved and, and become 
pushed, uh, you know, went in different directions. I'm looking at kind of these longer trends of questions of tourism as a place of meeting between those who come and and uh, and the island. Uh, what that means, the narratives of modernity associated with it, questions of migration and displacement, identity and statehood, uh, and isolation and communication. And of course, one big topic I'm not going to talk about here today so much, but which of course is also important and very, very much of interest to me is um, kind of undoing the naturalization of the assumption that it's an island inhabited by Croats who always were Croats and who are Croats today. And it's not so much for the sake of being a revisionist and arguing that uh, the inhabitants are not Croats today, but not taking the narrative of nation building as for granted and seeing different choices people's made, pe the strong support, for example, for Yugoslav political parties in the interwar period, at least at first, much stronger than elsewhere in many parts of, uh, of Yugoslavia, the, um, the, the, the other identity options, the, the, the relationship, the difficult relationship with those who identified as Italian speakers, and then as Italians over time. So to rather, in a certain way, look at those relations rather than reading history backwards. One of the defining features of, um, of um, the, the, which I will look at today, is what I, these kind of global connections, the showing how the island is embedded in these global networks uh, through different historical periods. And I will call this, so, so to speak, of pilgrims, fishermen, scholars, tourists. Yet I would like to illustrate this connectedness. So um, these are different historical periods and different historical examples, which illustrate and where I will 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 give you give you some background on how I see the island exactly the opposite of being uh, isolated. And I will do this through diff three different historical periods. Or the first one I will just mention in passing here, and I devote a bit more time to the Habsburg and the Yugoslav period. The first one was the long Venetian period, um, which which uh, is less uh, of focus here, but I just want to mention it also with the illustration here of a southern German pilgrim, Konrad Grünenberg, who drew this uh, this vista of Hwar town in 1487. And he was one of dozens, in fact, probably hundreds of pilgrims who um, traveled past Hwar uh, in the period of the late 15th and early 16th century. Uh, and they did so because the best way to reach Jerusalem, which was the final destination of the journey, was through the Venetian shipping routes, which connected Venice through the Adriatic with the Eastern Mediterranean. And that route went past Hwar, which was in fact the wintering place of the uh, Venetian fleet and uh, an important port for, for Venice uh, and uh, uh, Central because, again, it offered a port which uh, the Eastern Adriatic offered, which the Western Adriatic did not, and which gave it the region historically strategic importance as long as shipping was of, of central significance. Um, and so the Venetian trade route with it brought pilgrims who leave a rich uh, sources about reports of the different visits along the coast, some impatiently waiting to go to Jerusalem and kind of ignoring what happened and mostly lamenting the bad winds which made them stuck in the town of Lessina, as the Italian Venetian name was, um, and others were more curious and explored the town. But already there, you can see that the town was not a backwater, but it was in fact part of a, you know, one of the most important European trading routes and also visiting routes. Those pilgrims were in fact the precursors to the Grand Tour, as one would call it later on, be it through Italy or be it through the sources of antiquity. In the turn from the medieval to the early modern period, if you had money and if you were either pious or curious, that would be the journey you would go on. Now, this importance of connections don't end with the Venetian period. And here, just an illustration of the many states and rules which um, Hwar experienced together with most of the rest of Dalmatia uh, throughout the last centuries. And again, this is as scholars who are working on Southeastern Europe often familiar with the many changes of rule 
um, which one experiences from Venice to Habsburg to the different incarnations of Napoleonic rule um, to the return of the Habsburg monarchy, Italian occupation after the First World War, then uh, membership in the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, or Yugoslavia, then part of the independent state of Croatia under first Italian and then German military rule, and then, of course, socialist Yugoslavia, followed by Croatia. And there on the right, you see a few of the stamps which the local authorities used over time under the different regimes they've experienced. So, of course, with these different rules come different centers of power and different orientations. But what is very important to notice is that even though, of course, relations with Venice, with Vienna or uh, Rome or uh, Belgrade were of central significance, they don't didn't constitute the only and often not the main types of global connections the island had. So assuming it's just a bilateral relation of a peripheral uh, island with the center which ruled it ignores the multitude of connections which it had otherwise um, over the centuries. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, I've talked briefly about pilgrims. Now I will briefly talk about fishermen. Um, so um, paradoxically, with the rise of the steamship, which eventually destroyed the local fishing fleets and uh, and um, sailing fleets of the islands um, because it centralized um, the steamship centralized um, shipping uh, among a few centers who could afford steamships which were in the big cities like uh, Rijeka, uh, Fiume or, or Trieste. Um, in the second half of the 19th century we see a huge boom of shipping on the island particular in the two uh, towns of Yelsa and Starigrad and it usually it actually initially emerged out of necessity there was a long tradition of sardine fishing um, in one fish there were several different traditions the one the tratta which involved multiple boats long nets and lights to get, gather large swarms of sardines and catch them uh, and they would be then salted in, and sold in barrels and shipped uh, far but over time those fishing grounds were depleted and the fishermen were forced to sail further and further until one of them, um, and then later on many more, went much further. And there's a route there of one of the ships, the Giuseppe II from the 1865, which was one of the first ones who made that journey, but again would be followed by dozens of other ones who went into the Mediterranean and instead of trying to fish in the Adriatic, went to Lampedusa, which is nowadays well known as a place where many North African refugees um, uh, aim for uh, to reach the European shores. Um, and they went shipping, uh, fishing in the, in the uh, waters of Lampedusa uh, and maintained close contact with both fishermen as well as facilities in Southern uh, Italy and Sicily. Um, and over time also um, uh, went and established um, uh, a settlement or rather joined a settlement in Media, which is uh, a place not marked on this map in Tunisia, where uh, a large Khwar fishing colony was set up to uh, engage in fishing in that area. So what we see from that is that um, those fishermen were not just going out to the sea and bring back fish to their own place, although, of course, it gave a huge boost to barrels which were made on every street corner of Stadigrad and Yelsa during that time to fill with the sardines, but many of them were actually salted and uh, packaged already in Lampedusa or elsewhere, and the fishermen, who were also merchants, and again, both fishermen and merchants, went all across the Mediterranean to sell those barrels. And here's just the one route where you can see how they went to different Greek uh, towns and ports, such as uh, Patras and Piraeus, but their journeys are documented to reach all the way to the Black Sea, to the mouth of the Danube, to, um, to the Eastern Mediterranean, but also all the way west to Portugal. Um, and over time, basically become a, a really a true Mediterranean network of fishermen who also then some of them settle permanently in Tunisia, some settle in Algeria, some settle in, in Portugal, some do it for good, some eventually return um, to, to, um, to uh, Khwar. And there are reports of a ship sailing into the port in, uh, in Medi in, in, in Tunisia, saying that as they sailed in, they said hi to about a half a dozen or more other Khwar fishermen who were uh, in port with their own boats. So this was not a single enterprise, but this was a larger enterprise. And you can see also here by quote in a newspaper 
um, from the time, the late, uh, I had a typo there, it's not Stergrad, but Stadegrad, of course, Dinko Politeo, who wrote, you know, that the, the port was so busy uh, in Stadegrad, one talked about Marseille, about Cairo, about Istanbul, about Galati, as well as about Split and Shibenik. So the, the world or the, the world for the fishermen was exchanging prices of sardines, prices of wine to sell as well from Marseille to um, to the to the Black Sea, and all of this ignored in many ways the empire which they were part of. So this is in a certain way quite important. This was not a Habsburg enterprise, but this was a local enterprise which really didn't care about national boundaries, whether they landed in the French colony colonies of North Africa or in the emerging Greek nation state, or whether they were. Um, they were uh, trading with uh, the Russian Empire or others. And so the impact of that, of course, was not just that those were fishermen, but they also transformed uh, society. Uh, and Richard Francis Burton, a well-known um, British traveler um, and discoverer, quote unquote, visited Khoar and you know talked about the the refinement of the captains, the long cour, and uh, how he felt that the insular Dalmatia much resembled Switzerland. And he didn't mean, of course, the mountains, but he meant a certain smallness combined with uh, a, a well-connectedness, um, being a crucial meeting trading place. So this shows you just one of the vignettes of global connectedness. Now, I move to a very different example, that of scholars, um, from, um, from fishermen to scholars. And um, just as a brief illustration that this was not just about merchant connections, but this was also about academic connections. So while the place was not a place where there was any higher uh, educational institutions, we find a number of scholars who were either self-taught um, uh, or who had, uh, like uh, Gregor Bucic, who I mentioned there, who who established actually a meteorological station in Khwar over 150 years ago, which uh, we have weather records going back to then, one of the earliest ones, to others who studied in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but who were eager correspondents with scholars across, uh, across Europe. So um, when, uh, in fact, one German scholar, a biologist, Ernst Heckel, who was an early advocate of Darwin, visited Hvar um, to do studies on corals and sponges and uh, a nice graphical illustration he made of those on the top left. Um, he was met by a local priest who was curious, uh, who said, you know, isn't it true, Professor, that Darwin is right and we are all descendants of the same uh, Catarine monkey? So um, this is not something he expected that a, that a clergyman would, uh, would, you know, seek confirmation that Darwin was right. Um, this certainly at that particular point in time was not the expected, uh, uh, the expected greetings. So um, these local scholars were very curious uh, in, you know, being on top of the latest scientific discoveries and Darwinism, of course, at that time was the cutting edge in many ways. And they corresponded extensively with people like Ernst Haeckel or Franz Unger, who was a biologist uh, based in Austria. Um, so it again shows a very different type of network of connectedness, which, um, which it, again was based on scholarship, on science, again, not caring about the uh, the capitals or about the state structures in which they operated in, but rather based on academic curiosity. And of course, the scholars who then came were also grateful for finding local counterparts who would provide them with, uh, you know, uh, assistance in conducting their research. Um, and that brings me to the next type of global connectedness. And here's actually a, a, a nice connection. Franz Unger, who was an Austrian biologist who visited Hvar um, to study sponges, apparently, I, I haven't seen them today, but back then they were, they were apparently of great uh, biological curiosity, um, also came up with the idea that this might be a very good place, not just to do academic research, but actually also to bring tourists. Uh, and he himself was one of the co-founders of the Hygienic Society of Lesina, created in 1869 as one of the earliest European tourist associations with the explicit goal of promoting tourism on the island. And uh, at the time, and you can see a poster there from the first hotel, which was opened 40 years later, um, uh, which, um, which uh, uh, sought to offer 
uh, healthy air in winter. Nobody, of course, at the time thought that it would be a good idea to go anywhere near to the sea in the summer uh, and not to mention to swim in it. Um, this was not the purpose of uh, tourism, but it was about good air, fresh air for those from the urban centers polluted um, to, to go to this uh, Luftkurort or the Riviera Kurort, as it was known. And this is when the term emerged to call Khvar um, the Madeira of, uh, of Austria-Hungary, uh, as we have these metaphors very often. And this association, which was though instigated or co-instigated by this Austrian scholar, was very much a, a local project, a local project in which the bishop participated in together with the local elites. Um, and they used it very much as a vehicle to promote their idea of modernity, um, the idea of a modern society. So one of the first things they introduced rules that beggars couldn't beg on certain parts, at least not to foreigners, and that making loud music was prohibited for the fragile foreign guests who would come. If you have ever been to Khwar today, the problem nowadays is more the reverse, that the locals are suffering from the loud foreigners who are uh, drinking day and night. So things have changed a little bit. But for them, it was also a way um, to lobby with the state to um, give them to develop, to invest more in the development of Dalmatia. Politicians, um, people like Yurei Bianchini, who is a, a very important Dalmatian politician of the late 19th century, who hails from Stalingrad, was always arguing, as I have a quote here, um, that um, um, it's always neglected by Vienna. It's a delicious diamond, and the tourists are appreciating it, but um, but uh, there it, it's 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 the, the backwardness, the lack of. Uh, uh, full use of the resources is something which they were using and the tourism in a certain way was the main vehicle to argue to Vienna that it should actually um, take care to provide a better infrastructure, more frequent boat connections, for example, with a steamship, and as a result, to in a certain way, overcome the position of being Cinderella um, or uh, uh, in, in the uh, local in the local descriptions. Um, tourism in the in that period never fully took off. It, it didn't become an important tourist destination, although basic hotels opened. Um, it was just a little bit too far away for many. The boat came twice a week for most of the Austro-Hungarian period. Um, and really mass tourism is a phenomenon which uh, becomes only common uh, after World War II, although in the interwar period, it does become a very important tourist destination already for um, tourists from Czechoslovakia, um, and Austria in many in many cases, and uh, more places are open. But again, it's mostly foreign tourists rather than domestic tourists. There's more to be said about that, but that's another topic. So that's another connection, of course, where again, tourists are both a, both a financial resource, but also a source of arguments to be offered to the state why um, more investments, more care is very important, but also one which then creates all kinds of uh, channels of communication, um, down to the fact that uh, one of the local communist activists in the 1930s received his illicit communist literature from a visiting uh, Austrian Jewish uh, engineer who provided him with those pamphlets. Um, so, uh, accidentally, as he reports, when he was staying in the hotel and apparently had 200 communist flyers with him. I don't know if that's the way people travel, but uh, but that's the official story. So again, connections emerge as a result of that. Now, um, of course, the, the other, the main story which people often think about when they think about these connections is, of course, migration, um, which is the big story in places like Dalmatia, which saw a massive outflow of people in the late 19th century. And there you can see some just simple data to show you that, um, you know, in a place like Kotor Khvar, which is the, 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 the area which includes also the island of Vis, um, thousands left in a population which was, you know, basically uh, only 20, 30,000, depending on the point in time. So very significant share of the population left. Um, one of the areas which saw the largest number of, of emigration um, in the late 19th century, uh, mostly to the United States, but also to places like Argentina and Chile. Um, and, um, and they create all kinds of new connections. I mean, they are 
wonderful stories of those linkages. I mean, many also go to New Zealand. So if you are familiar with New Zealand, um, there's a term for the, the Dalmatian uh, migrants, they're called Dalis, um, from short for Dalmatians. Um, uh, and uh, so there are these kind of linkages. And of course, we know that most, at least a significant share of those, uh, of those migrants actually return back to Dalmatia. So they're not, it's not a one-way ticket. And there are, of course, many exchanges which endure for generations um, to come through remittances, through people returning, especially the earlier migrants were young men often returning to find a bride um, for them to return again. We also have many stories of people who move back and forth multiple times, um, but often to the disappointment of national activists without the same enthusiasm for the national projects. And I just uh, found it very fitting, a, a quote here from Ante Tresic Pavicic, who in fact was born in the house opposite to the one I showed you pictures in the very beginning, in a small village. He was a, a very prominent creation writer of the period, also a member of the Austrian Reichsrat uh, as well, and later on would become the uh, Yugoslav ambassador, also closely associated with Ivo Andrić, similar biographies in some ways in terms of a uh, writer who became diplomat, he became um, the ambassador of Yugoslavia to Madrid as well as to Washington. Um, and he went to the United States in 1905 in the hope to discover those Croats who would be enthusiastic Croats. And, um, and he discovered that, in fact, many of them didn't feel themselves as Croats at all. Their connection to the homeland was often in a way that they saw themselves in a very local identity. And also there, this quote, which uh, also conveys some of the you know, widely held anti-Semitic stereotypes of the time, but also says, you know, this old homeland which bore... Uh, which bore us was a stepmother to us is the term. So they um, this quote, which uh, very much disappointed Ante Tresic Pavicic, who hoped to find fellow Croats and found those who actually were rather embittered about the homeland. But again, this uh, kind of sense of bitterness about the homeland did not stand in the way of the many personal connections, which of course those migrants maintained and which again embedded uh, the island in another layer of dense networks uh, uh, around the globe, again, ignoring the, the countries in which uh, they were they were in. The last vignette, the last uh, kind of connection, global connection is uh, refugees. Um, and here I will tell you about two refugee stories which connected the island, um, which um, show you just the, 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 the multiple webs. Um, both are um, in World War II. The first one uh, is in the early phases of the war, when um, the island, together with other parts of Dalmatia, while either were directly attached to Italy or were uh, under military, uh, Italian military dominance, and as a result, while officially being part of the NDH, the Croatian independent Croatian state, uh, were de facto under Italian military control. And many Jews from Yugoslavia, but also elsewhere, decided to flee to the Italian zone because they were less uh, at risk of being deported to concentration camps than in the German zones, because Italy was uh, at least initially reluctant to cooperate with uh, Germany on the deportation of the Jewish population, including those who had fled to the area. So um, this doesn't mean that the treatment was all that uh, was always good, but it meant that they were safer than they would be elsewhere. So we find hundreds of Jews who are stranded on Khwar in different places in 1942 and 1943. Um, they are put up in the hotels, which are no longer visited by tourists because the tourism industry has, of course, come to a standstill. And there are wonderful memoirs of the Jew, of many Jews who had fled from especially Bosnia-Herzegovina um, because those from Croatia, from Zagreb, would have fled more to places like Crkvenica uh, and, and more in the, the western parts of the Adriatic coast, uh, and who, who, who describe the kind of ambivalent relationship between being somewhat incarcerated by the Italians, but in a way which was a very loose curfew and uh, how they interacted and found their way around uh, an island which has no traditional Jewish population, unlike other parts in Dalmatia. They were then uh, soon thereafter uh, removed and they had to be, they were put in a camp in Raab, which, uh, which uh, was a camp both for Jews uh, as well as for um, 
uh, those, especially from the Western lands of Yugoslavia under Italian rule, who had resisted and who were treated, in fact, considerably worse because they were seen as a security threat, while the Jewish population was more, uh, I think, suffering from the uncertainty of not knowing where their future would lie, especially considering Italians' continued alliance with, with Germany. Once Italy capitulated in 1943, some fled, some joined partisan brigades, but others also were then uh, captured tragically and murdered by a German uh, by deportation to German concentration camps. So this is one story of refugees um, who found their way to Khvar, and there's a different one, which is those who left Khvar, um, and they left together with uh, thousands of other Dalmatians uh, in 1943, exactly at that same moment, towards Egypt. Um, I've written about this in an article for Slavic Review, um, but I just want to mention it here as another kind of global connection. Um, around 30,000 Dalmatians, and including many islanders from Khwar and the other neighboring islands, are evacuated by the partisans with the help of the British to Egypt um, because um, they worry that the, um, the interlude between the Italian um, the Italian uh, 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 armistice uh, surrender and the arrival of German troops uh, would mean that many partisan sympathizers would be facing severe repressions and it became clear that the German army was advancing on those territories very quickly. So they were first evacuated to Wies, the outmost lying island, and from there with the help of the British uh, first to Italy um, and then uh, eventually to camps in Egypt, which were previously held by the British army uh, in anticipation of the German attacks in North Africa. Uh, and the most important camp of all of those was the camp of El Shat, which um, is at the, at the end of the Suez Canal on the Red Sea, close to the Red Sea, but in a very inhospitable desert environment um, where the Dalmatians uh, built a tent city, um, really functioning with uh, schools, a newspaper, um, and uh, training for crafts. Uh, uh, there was a football club. There was uh, the whole kind of urban infrastructure, as I argued in my article. It was kind of the first, many ways, kind of quasi-urban experience for many who lived in a in a settlement which was much bigger than any city they had usually lived in before. Um, and it was very much organized by the partisan movement. So this was not um, in a certain way unlike the other refugee experiences, especially the mirroring image of mostly Greek refugees who fled the Dodecanese islands um, in particular, um, who, who were not organized politically and who were uh, in a certain way unsure about their future. Those were Yugoslav, often partisan supporters, but not exclusively, who um, saw also from the partisan point of view of the Communist Party, which uh, stood it behind it, an opportunity to organize and to mobilize and to inculcate uh, uh, to, uh, to indoctrinate in many ways um, the Dalmatians were there with the idea of the future Yugoslav society. So it was, as I've argued, state building in the Yugo in the Egyptian desert in many ways. But that experience um, of of the two years, sometimes three years, they've spent in the Egyptian desert, which of course was isolated. Um, in many ways, it mirrors some of the contemporary refugee experiences. Egypt didn't want to have the refugees too visible to its own population for the worry that the population might be resentful. Um, so the context with the local uh, population were limited, although there were meeting points. There are stories of, of, of connections. Some also had connections um, with Yugoslavs in um, in, in Cairo, there was the royal Yugoslav uh, government in exile in part in Cairo. So some who joined, quote unquote, the other side went there. And of course, there were also vivid memories and global connection. I haven't mentioned many Dalmatians, including uh, uh, Huar laborers, helped to build the Suez Canal. So in many ways, it was the same canal their ancestors had built to which they came back to, to camp on its banks hoping for the end of the war and their return to their homeland. So this brings to an end a little bit of a whirlwind tour over some th themes. Um, and of course, my book my, my, has many more discussions about local changes and developments. But what I try to tell you through those vignettes is really show you how a place which seems so remote and so sometimes peripheral uh, in, in the eyes of an outside observer, at least when it comes to the period before the development of mass tourism and the reachability through uh, airlines landing in split airport, um, that this place was actually profoundly embedded in the global 
economic, intellectual, uh, human contacts, and that those contacts were multiple and often very much ignoring state and nation frameworks, and that that offers maybe just a way to look at those places such as far in a bit different light than just looking at them as forgotten corners of larger empires or larger states. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to unpin you here. There we go. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And everyone in the audience, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. We're going to move into our conversation, post-talk conversation. So be thinking about questions and go ahead and raise your hand if you have any. Um, maybe I'll just start with one as you guys are collecting your thoughts. I have a lot of different questions. First, I just want to congratulate you on this really interesting work. It was fascinating. And I'm sure there's this is just the tip of the iceberg. Obviously, you have so much there to work with. But I guess one of the things I was thinking about the whole time was, um, you know, kind of Bulgaria or thinking of other sort of land-based isolated mm. communities um, in the same, over the same periods, but how those land-based isolated communities were also connected through some, many of these same channels, trade, um, scholars or, you know, educated people, migrants, um, refugees, etc. <laughs> and so um, one of the things I was wondering is how different is sort of water isolation or presumed isolation, which is really connectivity via water because people can transport like water isn't necessarily always a barrier. It can also be a connective kind of um, thing to like thinking about more land-based sort of rural isolated, say like mountain communities. Mm. Um, or other kind of communities that we might think of as isolated. Like, is there a, a difference of degree or is there a difference of how these connections are made? Or, I mean, can we, should we think about it in an entirely different way, I guess is what I'm kind of thinking. Um, like I said, there's a lot of parallels. Mm -hmm. There's some other questions I would have about like, was this also a phenomenon? But I think you were kind of answering some of my questions too, as I went. So that's Thanks. just a very general one. Yeah, I think that's it's it's something I've been wondering about. I mean, and again, I'm I'm uh, I, I I know in less detail, of course, about other, let's say, more more uh, land based, uh, quote unquote, remote communities. I mean, one thing which, of course, was striking that the sea actually was a was it was a great connector, uh, and and I think the idea to think of the sea as something which disconnects or which makes place, places remote is a very contemporary understanding of the sea, and not a very kind of historical one. That, of course. If we go back until at least the 19th century, a place which is based next to the sea is so much more easily can reach. You know, within a couple of weeks, you could go by boat from Khwar all the way across the Mediterranean. In the same time, if you were in a remote, let's say, town in southern Serbia, you could not make that trip. Um, or then you would have to go to the sea and then start your trip by sea, but you wouldn't be able to make such a trip land-based over such long distances with the same speed. And relative safety, I mean, overall, it was a safer journey on the sea than it was on land. The fact that, like, then, you know, and it's interesting to see how then all of a sudden the rise of the steamship, which meant that all of a sudden the connections become much more centralized and become much more located around certain nodes, such as uh, the big port cities, then all of a sudden they become much more you, you see a lot more concern about feeling isolated because all of a sudden the main transport link is the is the steamship and that comes twice a week. So all of a sudden you can't quote unquote leave more than twice a week, which of course is also a reflection of the way in which society changes um, in the late 19th century, it becomes more mobile, arguably, uh, probably more beyond that. So, I mean, I would be fascinated to, to see how that compares to somebody who, who looks at, a, at rural communities. But of course, I know very much from people who've been looking at, um, you know, especially, you know, um, temporary migration uh, in the Southern Balkans um, to places like Istanbul or elsewhere, where, where exactly we know there's been, it's a different migratory patterns, but there is actually this long tradition of people who are leaving their home and then going somewhere else and coming back and that, and bringing with them ideas and bringing them with them influences and that these exchanges do occur they have a they have probably a different um temporal pattern i mean but again also 
again, Khabar, I didn't talk about that beyond the anecdote about the, the, the longer fishing routes, but of course they have a lot of these shorter fishing excursions across the Adriatic or trade across the, to the other side of the Adriatic to uh, places like uh, Ancona, Pescara, Bari, and so on. Um, and so they are also, so these kind of more short-term exchanges also happened. Um, and so from that point of view, exactly, uh, uh, Pachelaba was, I was thinking of that. Of that. Um, so, so I think it might be quite interesting to, to look at, you know, uh, 19th century or you know the kind of forms of, of, of mobilities um more in a comparative perspective and seeing how they are similar and different in terms of distances um temporalities and so on thank you for that um steven siegel uh, would you like to ask your question um yes thanks uh and thanks mary and, and florian for an excellent talk um, I, I just have a really brief question about the, the nature of these camps as refugee camps and in specifically within the context of Yugoslav or, or Balkan history, let's say, as sites for social experimentation. Um, I'm really struck by your, your research and, and your vocabulary in using these as, as maybe benign or microcosmic examples when i'm thinking of camps um you know having done research on on the holocaust um and now dealing with filtration camps in the context of ukraine uh, the, like the last word that comes to mind is, is benign i mm. i'm just thinking about um you know kidnapping and torture and it, like the wor the worst of the worst of the banality of evil let's say or the that's you know back to the back to the 1950s um and maybe before so i i guess the remoteness question what we were just talking about with with bodies of water and and then the proximity toward the middle east i'm wondering if you if you might explain how you kind of came to the conclusion of of this benignity mm -hmm. um and if that if that holds in larger you know sort of evidence that you've collected for the later Yugoslav period. Mm. Is there a moment where the camps as refugee camps kind of turn into something else? Or is there always this utopian, maybe even a close space narrative to, to these, mm. um, you know, specific places that you're dealing with? And, and the geographical dimension obviously is so important um, because of the scale of those camps themselves. But I, I leave this as an open question for you to interpret. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Stephen. I, I really appreciate that that question. I mean, it, it, of course, I mean, I think the, the first, I mean, a very important distinction I think to make is that those camps were people who who fled, well, there are some exceptions I'll mention in a second, but mostly who fled in, and who were hosted by, by a friendly power, right? So that, you know, unlike what you were talking about, and of course, and that's the difference to, you know, whatever prisoner of war camps, concentration camps, or the camps we, we're, we're seeing today, uh, where it's a hostile power uh, entrapping uh, a, a civil, mostly civilian population against their will. Now, this was a population which, you know, was provided shelter, so to speak, from the fear of German repression by the British. Um, and as a result, the basic premise was one of assistance rather than of repression. Um, now, of course, there are a couple of caveats with that. Uh, the first caveat is that not everybody left voluntarily. So, for example, the inhabitants of the island of Vis, where the British built a base for the partisans, were forcibly removed. They had to leave. They didn't have a choice. So while many of them were partisan supporters, not all of them were happy to leave. Um, and so there was some degree of resistance um, to, to being displaced. Um, and there were also some people who were moved there who were not seen as a threat by the partisans to the degree that they would be killed because of course partisans would kill um, people they suspected of collaborating with the Italians or who were fear who they feared would be was collaborators, but those who they didn't trust fully. And so who might, you know, they th fear they might speak. So some of them were taken with them. So they were there against their will. So there was a, a level of coercion um, with it. They were clearly a minority. They were then, because it was the British who also had good ties to the royal government, um, offered them a chance to leave. So they were able to leave the camp. There was a separate camp for royalist 
um, uh, uh, supporters. So there were interviews which were held with the with a British commander overseeing them, where people had to express themselves. It was interesting that the only reason you were allowed to leave was if it was political. So you couldn't leave the camp if you said, you know, and there were stories, in fact, of women uh, who were the, because there, there was a there's a gender dimension. The the most the camp was disproportionately large number of women because of course the men would be fighting with the partisans. That was the expectation. So the men were either injured or they were elderly or had other disabilities which didn't allow them to fight or they were very young, and it was women. So there were cases of women who said, "I want to leave the camp. I want to go and move to my with my relatives in New Zealand or in in America." And then the partisans said, well, but if your husband is fighting with the partisans, you can't leave because, you know, you, you're kind of betraying him. You're betraying the cause. So, so, so women were then not allowed to leave, although they made the request um, when they had actually relative, usually relatives um, overseas. So, so there was certainly, uh, so it's not about glorifying this and saying, you know, it had its, you know, sh its lights and its shadows in a certain way. And it also foreshadowed some of the system of the communist rule in Yugoslavia, especially in the early phase. It was certainly, you know, there was certainly a high level of energy and the people who were there were, you know, generally supportive of the Yugoslav project because they were, you know, again, they were not a representative, but a party self-selected group. But of course, as time went on, you know, they, they certainly were also controlled by a local structure, which the British were at first very suspicious about with this ambivalent relationship they had to the Yugoslav communists. But then they admired also because it ad administered the camp, it made their work easier because they didn't have to man manage the camp in the way in which they had to manage the camp where predominantly, for example, Greek uh, refugees were housed. But at the same time, they realized, and I have, there are several reports of also um, American volunteer uh, uh, or NGOs who, who went there, who, who noted the kind of rising, you know, the, the, the communist system, which also was in place, which, which you know, Per definition, at that time, was coercive, right? Um, so it's 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 a tricky it's 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 a it's a very ambivalent experience, I would say, in many ways. Where talking to people who have gone through it often speak very positively as a formative, you know, young experience. But others, of course, who left and then went to the other camps, see it as you know the first step towards the authoritarian Yugoslav state it was in the 1940s and 50s. So, but all of that said, I would not compare it to the you know the the hostile camp experience of concentration camps or other camps, which, 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 of course, millions of uh, of you know inhabitants of European continent experienced in the 1940s. Thank you very much, Florian, Thank you. for thanks. Uh, yes, to uh, tackling this question and uh, specifically the nuances, uh, it's important. Uh, I think that's such a complex. Uh, uh, question, uh, and I would like to thank Stephen actually for addressing it uh, because. Um, as we see, historical examples and present experience um, gives us a lot of food for thought uh, as to how those are evaluated. And uh, I do appreciate the fact that uh, you, you are not shying away from uh, answering this, uh, those uh, questions regarding the nuances. Now, Florian, I would like to ask Theodora Dragostinova has a question uh, to ask, and we still have uh, other questions in the chat, uh, which we'll address uh, after Theodora's question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and um, I'm very excited to hear about this project because I'm too thinking about island history. I actually just came back from uh, Greece where I'm trying to locate an island in an archive. Uh, but uh, so I'm very excited about this book. I look forward to reading it and look forward to maybe having you know a conversation later on about that. I really like how you set it up. But because I'm now, um, I mean, I like the framework. I like the themes. I really like how, you know, um, you, you go about it. I will look forward to reading the entire book, of course. Um, but because I'm thinking about research process right now, I might actually ask you a few questions here uh, to maybe sure. tell us a little bit more about the research process here in terms of, uh, you know, methodologies and sources. But I'm also very much interested in actually chronology here, because you set up the project as trying to, uh, you know, disentangle this like tension between isolation and communication. Uh, you say it up as a global history, which it appears to be, uh, but I wanted to ask you first, which time period did you find most 
challenging to research. I see that you have a lot of examples from the 19th century. I'm personally completely intimidated by the 19th century. I think that the logic of the 19th century is just like so different. Those mm. of us who actually studied the 20th and 21st century, uh, I fear I may not completely grasp what is going on in the 19th century. So I just wanted to, and you know, oh, you also mentioned the Venetians, right? I mean, what do we even do with the Venetians? And of course, because I'm looking at Greece, I go back to antiquity in some of these cases. So I'm <laughs> really wondering what to do with chronology here. So I would love your insight uh, here. Um, and then, of course, you're writing on a historical topic and you know that you're going to get these uh, uh, questions from historians, but I do want to ask you about change all the time. Uh, and I do want to ask you in this research that you're presenting here, which is the time period that you are seeing the most, how do I put it, you know, vibrant, um, you know, global connectivity? Uh, on the island of Hvar. I mean, we, which is, you know, can you single out like, you know, uh, 20 years, a quarter of century when you might designate that to be the most, you know, global period of the history of Hvar? I'm sorry if this is too much, uh, but just thought that- You're just talk. asking easy questions. I really appreciate them. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. No, I think these are really good questions and I think they'll, they'll um, you know, keep me, keep me up at night. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, but I think they, they, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're really kind of, I mean, these are all things I've struggled with, and and you know, I I, I initially didn't want to write at all about the Venetian period um, because, again, I'm not a historian. I mean, you know, I consider myself a historian of the 20th century um, and a political scientist, and the 19th century was already a bit of a leap of faith, and then going back further seemed really like completely insane. But then I discovered that I can't really do this job properly if I don't go back further, and I mean. And so, of course, I say it with all the caveats. This is not the, the this is the least original part of my of my book, and also not as long as the other ones. But I feel like I need to, because the structures which emerge later on are very important um, from that period, um, and it's always a point of reference later on. So if they don't talk about it, 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 I feel like there's a big gap um, in the project. Um, and so this is why I decided to talk about it. Um, and and try to make use of the sources I can reasonably feel to understand and, and use. And of course, then you talk to people who who have worked in the Venetian period, and then who can you know make sure that you're not writing complete nonsense, um, you know, and, and 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 so on. But but again, what what I what I mostly was interested in is the 19th and 20th century. And and um, and, and again, I mean you discover again the continuities on a local level between those periods. I mean, again, there's, you have these big ruptures of empires and so on, but you know, the people who are mayors, the people who are local intellectuals and so on are the same, right? And they're they are managing in different periods. So, you know, this uh, writer I've mentioned, Ante Tresic Pavicic, you know, he began in the Habsburg monarchy as a prominent politician. He became, continued to be a diplomat in the Yugoslav period, and he ended up being a rather, a rather uh, crazed supporter of the Endeha regime. And so, you know, so he was in all of those, all of those different eras, very important over half a century. Uh, and many of the others, Yuri Bianchini, very important journalist in the 1860s, politician in the 1880s, 1890s. He then becomes the founding president of Jadranska Straja, which is an, called the, the Adriatic Sentinel, which is an important organization in the first Yugoslavia to promote the Adriatic spirit of Yugoslavia. Um, so, you know, these people have these, these kind of uh, breaking the boundaries of these eras, which we like to categorize in. Um, so... The, the, so the, these are difficulties, um, and and of course also what you what you're struggling with is sources. I mean, in a in a way of how to handle sources in a man. How much there is, uh, and it ha I have to be selective. Uh, uh, so one thing which helped, and I think it would have been a very different project if it had been about a different place, which is not as well worked on. I think Far has very rich. Uh, historical research, which of course all has its historical biases. Uh, you know, the, the communist period was mostly obsessed, of course, with the history of the Communist Party, as well as with the peasant uprising of the 1510s, which was an important uh, event, but which got blown out of proportion because, again, it was kind of a proto-communist uprising. Um, so, you know, you have these, these biases and, of course, the national histories, which, again, sees all of these processes as a natural evolution towards a creation island. 
so but but you have very rich secondary material which really helped me to work on that and you know long-time president of the creation or in fact yugoslav academy of sciences was uh, an archaeologist and historian from the from Huar who wrote about the adriatic and about Huar with a lot of biases of his era but again so they have also worked on they have translated a lot of sources and they've worked in a lot of published those over the years so there's a lot of red threads which you can work with and then i've kind of dipped selectively into archives to complement that um the yugoslav archive in belgrade and then the uh, split archive, the Croatian National Archive, the Vienna Archive, and then also the UN Archive, for example, has been excellent for the for the El Shat experience uh, during the Second World War, um, and the British and American National Archives, but also other periods. So, so that together helped me to give a picture of, of kind of illustrations of many of the phenomena which I then can, which I have the, the, the secondary sources with. Now, if you ask me about this kind of when was thing, when was the most exciting period in terms of these connections, I would say surprisingly, I would say the 1860s to 1880s, something like in that era, because that's when that's when the, the fishermen traveled um, the Mediterranean, that's when the, the scholars corresponded with the German, mostly German and Austrian scholars about Darwin. Um, and this is when tourism began on the island. Um, and so this was really, uh, there was you know, also it was an economic boom at the time. Um, then, uh, uh, um, then we had the, the, the wine crisis in the late 19th century where the wine production was destroyed. Um, and as a result, the economic basis of the island was destroyed so because I didn't talk about the economic side of the story, but of course that's very important as well. Um, and then um, really we have the migration, which is triggering all of that. Um, uh, which is triggered by that and as a result of course migration leads to connection but it's also it's a story more of of decline um but but in the 1860s 1870s there was this sense of 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 connections based on on prosperity and based on you know on on relative wealth and an emerging middle class on the island which was i think you know considering the small size of the towns in fact was quite significant and politically culturally creating of cultural centers and of course the story I didn't talk about today, also what happened at the time is the shift from Italian as the lingua franca um, to Croatian uh, and the whole idea that one needs to promote Croatian language as the, the main uh, source of identity. So, so a lot of things happen in, in really two decades of great significance and a large part of it is the kind of interconnectedness of the island during that period. Um. Well, we have a question from Kit Belgum, but, but Kit, first I just wanted to ask a question from the chat just to make sure we get this question asked by Amanda Brown. And that is, to what extent did the island's residents perceive themselves as isolated or peripheral to the empires and states they belong to? And so maybe with that, you could just talk a little bit about if you found this, their own sort of geographic imaginary, like who they thought themselves to be and where, you know, in mm -hmm. a sense. Like, were they the center of their own map rather than the periphery of somebody else's? Yeah, actually, they. I mean, uh, there's a there's a, a, a nice book by an anthropologist um, about Khwar who wrote it's an island of islands. Um, and let me just see if I have, yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, uh, Anna Perinic Lewis. Uh, she, she called it, uh, it's called Otoci Otoka Khwar, so the islands of the island of Khwar, where she argues very much and she talks about. Uh, Campanilism, the Italian, you know, kind of uh, sense of very strong local identity, and I think that's certainly something you had. And I have to also tackle that in my book is to argue that actually was it was it actually an island? I mean, was Khwar an island in the self perception of its citizens or its inhabitants? And I think, and actually, for many periods, it wasn't. The people didn't think of themselves primarily as Khwarians, but they actually thought of themselves often as inhabitants of a much more localized area. And one very simple way to explain it is, in fact, that the main road connecting the, the main towns of the island um, was only open in the 1930s. So before that, you had donkey paths which connected the, the, the main towns of the island. But if you actually wanted to get from one town to the other, you needed to take a ship. And then again, if you need to take a ship from one town to the other, how important is it that they are on the same island and not on the next island, which in fact might be closer. So is it even an island beyond the geographical island? Um, and, and then you have uh, these centers which have very different identities. Um, um, 
which becomes very important during the national period. I mean, places like Stadigrad and Khwar, which are two towns which have a long history. I mean, Stadigrad has a history as a Greek colony uh, in antiquity, um, and as a result, has a strong kind of had a very strong sense of, a, of also an urban elite long established during the Venetian period. You have other towns like Yelsa, which emerged only in the 19th century, very strong and had a very strong national sense because many of its inhabitants were migrants from the villages, which were more Croatian speaking, and so had a much stronger sense of, of being uh, somebody said called the national brain of Khvar. If somebody used the metaphor, so so there was also this very strong distinctive sense of identity uh, uh, on the island. So in that sense, there was disconnect within the island in many ways, which only grew together very gradually. And then which were the points of reference? Vienna is very, was, for example, as a, you know, one of the longer periods of time being Habsburg was always a very remote center uh, for, for, it was only, it was very absent, it was the absent landlord. And it was in a certain way more something where people had pleaded to um, and, and they later on would plead to uh, to Belgrade very often because it had a very similar perception to, to kind of say, well, what are you doing? You know, why don't you take better charge of, take better care of us? But it's, it's not in the sense of oppression, which of course did occur, but it's more in the sense of this very remote center, which seems not really to do much uh, in your in your area to solve the problems you're facing. And then, of course, you have the more local administrative center, which for a long time was Zadar or Zara, which was the administrative center of the of Dalmatia, but uh, which again seemed very remote for many for many people. So so th did people feel remote? Well, not so much as most of their choices were not related to those centers. I mean, the trade didn't go through those centers. Um, they went elsewhere. So they probably, I don't, I mean, it's very hard to reconstruct because people don't really say, oh, we feel so isolated and remote, but it's not really the dominant theme. It, it does emerge in the 19th century when tourism emerges, as I mentioned, and there then they say, we need more ships. We feel we feel isolated from the tourists. The tourists don't come to us. And they plead to you know the Austrian Lloyd and say, why don't you increase the frequency of stops? So there it comes in, the sense. And it's really emerging, I would say, in the late 19th century that there's a sense, but it's not about going to Vienna, but it's about more kind of being interconnected with other global networks, which you know, kind of dropped by the roadside with the decline of the sail ships. And then you're dependent on this one provider. And that is kind of not giving you what you're expecting. I love this answer. I think it's so important to think about technologies of transportation and what that means for each locale over time. And such a great Thank answer. You. Um, Kit, did you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I feel like an interloper here, so I don't do anything having to do with the Balkans. Um, I'm a 19th century German studies scholar, so uh, I came uh, to the talk uh, because of the title about global connections. I'm very interested in the new efforts to pursue global history, transnational history. So this is very exciting, but I also work on travel writing. I work on German migration to America. I work on geographical curiosity. So. Oh my gosh, I got so much out of this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just kind of wanted to come back to Mary's first question um, and add a little footnote um, because I also work on nationalism. And um, I think maybe uh, it's a completely different part of Europe, but maybe uh, a little hint to the answer of, you know, what actually um, brings people together, what isolates people might be the wonderful book from decades ago by Eugene Weber on peasants into Frenchmen. Um, because in that art, in that book, he basically argues it's not until the train shows up that, that peasants all around the French countryside start being able to, and then thinking about defining themselves as French rather than their regional identities. And so it really kind of comes back to this issue of technology you're also just addressing. Um, as technology changes, notions of identification de facto are going to change. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to put him in there as maybe a little bit of a, of a way of um, approaching the topic, even though from, from a very different region. But thank you so much for a really, really rich um, presentation and to all the questions. Um, you guys have an amazing circle. <laughs> well, 
Thank you so much. And thank you for, the, I mean, uh, Eugene Weaver is still one of my favorites on, on, on nationalism in the 19th century. And I think, I mean, I really appreciate that, that observation. Um, I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's of course much more complicated in a multinational environment. I mean, in a, let's say, in an environment where they're competing national projects. Um, I mean, in France, we have one which is confronted, of course, primarily by very strong local identities. While there, we have very strong local identities, but they're also different national projects. I mean, one of the stories which is told, which is maybe, you know, maybe uh, apocryphal, is, is that, uh, that um, uh, to a, a Croatian uh, a, a nationalist intellectual of the 19th century and a Serbian one uh, visit Orebic, which is a town in Korčula, and they talk to a local, uh, one of them is Vuk Stefanovic Karadic, and, uh, and the other one, and I, I think it was uh, Ludovic Guy was, was, was there, um, and they talk to a po local person, they ask him, which language do you speak? And he says, you know, Nashki, you know, ours. And, and then they say, no, aren't you speaking? And then Karadzic says, aren't you speaking Serbian? He said, what? I don't know. He said, well, do you understand me? Yes, I do understand you. Well, then you're speaking Serbian. And then they said, well, no, actually, I think you're speaking Croatian because that's the way. Oh, why didn't you say so earlier? Yes, of course I speak Croatian. And he's kind of, you know, second guessing what the people want to hear. Um, um, and and it tells you because there are these different, you, you could be, um, um, absolutely you're right. It's it's on Periashas, of course, it's opposite Korshula, not on Korshula. Um uh and um uh and it's uh so there are different projects. There's a South Slav Yugoslav project, which could be a national or a supranational project. You could be uh Croatian, you could be Yugoslav, you could be Serbian, you could also be Dalmatian. I mean, there was a strong sense of Dalmatian identity at the time, and Croat was actually associated with something which was in Zagreb and in the in the the region of Croatia, which was part of the, of course, uh, of the Kingdom of Croatia, which was part of the the um, Hungarian half of the monarchy. So, so the the term Croatian took off very slowly in Dalmatia because there were all of these other alternative identifications. Not to mention Italian, which also was for some. And again, these boundaries only became clear over time. And if you look at the, you know the Austrian statistics, there was really a shift in the 1880s when, you know. Before that, because Austrian statistic asks about Umgangssprache, which was language of use rather than mother tongue, uh, and you know, up to a third of people said they spoke Italian as lang uh, um, as the the main language of use. Within a decade, it switched to like less than ten percent. So it kind of really switched from from Italian being you know very significant language to completely marginal language. And this shows you how these choices are made in a relatively short period of time. And communication is one of them. And you know the national activists who create reading clubs, who create newspapers, um, uh, and even all of that. Interestingly, with very low literacy rates. So it's not literacy which you know you know people like Benedict Anderson emphasizes a lot. Yes, print press is important, but it's actually the elites very much. And of course, that process is far from concluded. I mean, like Eugene Weaver talks about France, how you know this process is not even done by World War One in many ways. We find it in the interwar period where. Um, the Yugoslav state is constantly worried that the Italian schools are too good to, to they, they pay people to go to those schools and that they might become Italians. And they talk about these national unconscious people who might become Italians. And this in a place where there were on the whole island 200 Italians out of 20,000 people. Uh, and uh, but the state was so worried because they felt that the citizens weren't you no know, nationally conscious enough. And they probably, I mean, there's no evidence that people made those choice, but the, the anxiety is reflecting probably of the real of the reality that most villagers really didn't care about this, but they cared about agri agri agrarian reform. They cared about those issues much more than about whether they are, you know, Croat, Dalmatian, Yugoslav, uh, or, or how to label them. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful answer. I it made me think of how this, I've heard this term, uh, Nashski, I guess you've said, to talk, um, used between people from the former Yugoslav space today who are speaking and languages that, you know, Croatian, Serbian, Bosnian, Montenegrin, and trying to think of what to call it. <laughs> yeah. Um, in those conversations also, they return to our language it has a track record going back going back 150 years yes <laughs> um but i guess that also made me i'm so fascinated that you said the 1860s to 80s were the time of the most globalization and that actually made me think of you know thinking across these time periods thinking of a kind of a periodization um, of global connections and how 
I think most people would assume that those connections were going to be intensify over time. They might assume that under socialism, there was some kind of breakdown of that to some extent, although we know Yugoslavia is kind of an exception. But actually, we can also think about the modern period as putting up barriers in a lot of ways to movement across borders and, and that kind of thing. Well, so um, just a lot of food for, th I don't know if you want to like comment on that, but um, this is just kind of to I close mean, our think, event today. Yeah, something I think, that you know, realize. I think it's certainly something I keep, kept, you know, thinking about when I think of the fishermen going to Lampedusa and to, to Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And of course, I did also think about this when I thought about the refugees fleeing to Egypt. And in fact, many of the Greek refugees went uh, via Turkey and uh, Aleppo and Syria. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, it's, it's kind of reversing many of the routes which we're seeing today of refugees and who are, you know, uh, killed at sea in many ways in, in making those journeys. So, we, we see very physical manifestation of the way in which people are hindered from making those journeys today. And so the assumption that communication, you know, the, the means of communication are easier, but also the state efforts to 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 control them and to reduce Document them are stronger. <laughs> so, so you know, you couldn't be a fisherman spontaneously now in Hwar and just sail to, to Tunisia and Lampedusa and back <laughs> without a whole lot of obstacles, administrative and otherwise. I mean, they had them back then, they had quarantines, they had all of that but it wasn't just like an easy easy ride back then but to assume it's all easier and simpler today is, is certainly is certainly ignoring um the obstacles which states put in their way um yeah correct i just was thinking about one quick anecdote when i was in i was in dubrovnik in 1994 which is random time to be in dubrovnik because the war was going on um, and i naively thought we could get over land to albania and people said, no, no way. The only way to go is you take a boat to Bari and then you take a boat back to Duras. <laughs> and that's what we had to do. And it just made me realize that overland was a no-go. There was too many borders, there's too many problems, and there was no way to get there that way. Um, anyways, I just wanted to thank you for this wonderful session and for coming to Balkan Circle. And thank you to our audience for coming. And we will see, I hope, some of you in two weeks for our next session of Balkan Circle. Um, and in the meantime, have a wonderful Friday evening and weekend to everyone. Thank you so much for having Thank me. It's been a much. real pleasure. And I really appreciate the comments and questions. It's very helpful. It'll give, it Thank gives you. me a good push to finish my book. So, <laughs> Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank well, you I can't wait to read it. And work okay. like yours is really great for our field. It just helps us to think through the complexities of this fascinating region. <laughs>